I hope and pray you love the Lord in the way God wants you to. In this love, the grace of God will orchestrate all things for good, resonating through your life journey of faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? When Jesus asked disciples, you and me, through Peter, do you love me? He asks because he already loved them with all of his heart. And his love was not just a feeling without action, but it is love fulfilled through his action and his sacrifice. Disciples, on the other hand, actually they don't deserve this perfect love of Jesus. Even though Jesus met them after his resurrection and he promised them they would see Jesus in Galilee, the place of their reality and ministry, disciples decided to go what? Fishing. But even after such a disappointing action, the Lord Jesus didn't abandon them. Rather, instead, instead, he approached, come, found them again, and gave them the word of promise and guarantee. He said, throw your net to your right, and you will find some. What happened? By the emptiness of their boat, they threw another net, and the Lord bestowed 153 good fishes, so big and heavy that they thought their nets were going to rip. But despite, despite the massive, ca massive catch, their net held, and they arrived by the shore. So some people, many people wonder why 153 fishes, not 500 fishes. Why 153? So many people uh, was wondering about that. So, uh, the people wrote, uh, so uh, people think like that. Actually, at the time, the people wrote in Greek, not English or Korean, meaning their numbers were also alphabets. In biblical time, they didn't use the number we are using. Does it make sense? They're using the alphabet for numbering, such as A is 1, B is 2, like that. So when you read the 153, there is alphabet. So that they just translate according to that alphabet. But in my opinion, that's not a way to, that's not good way to approach it. And another interpretation is made based on the other recording of that place and time. And apparently, the fishermen of Galilee thought there were 153 types of good and eatable fishes in their deep and wide waters in Galilee. So, 153 types of fishes were caught in their net according to Jesus' word. Does it make sense? Yeah, so 153 is supposed to represent all kind of good things life can offer provided by Jesus. It's so blessed. It's so blessed. So that the visit of Jesus works like that. He fills our empty ships till it overflow and allow us to take them ashore without having our nets ripped off. Not only that, not only that, just cooked bread and fish on charcoal, prepare the table and fed them breakfast to the hungry and tired disciples. He didn't just prepare the food so the disciples could feed themselves. Jesus served Jesus served his disciples. After they finished their meal breakfast, Jesus didn't say anything, but after breakfast, after having breakfast, the Lord asked Peter three times, Simon, do you love me? Through his question, actually, Jesus restored and anointed Peter up. Peter couldn't 
comply with the hollow agape love which the Lord asked from him. He could only reply with philia, the love in a level he can understand. So the Lord Jesus lowered himself to the level of Peter and asked him the way he could handle. Likewise, when Jesus asks us, do you love me? He asks with heart and the sacrifice filled with his love. In this love, the Lord came back to us in our reality and restored us, anointed us, and came to an eye level with us. That is Jesus' love when he asks us, do you love me? Do you love me? The Lord asks us if we love him not just because he already loves us, but because he wants us, he wants you and me to love him as well. Love is not selfish. Love is not one-sided. Wanting to be loved by someone you love is only very natural. Actually, today's scripture, you know what? is a scene where Jesus bestowed the great ministry to his disciples. We're going to talk about that next week. As the people of Jesus sent by him, we must fulfill the ministry of heavenly kingdom in our daily lives, not only here, in our daily life, our reality, our ministry. But as we receive this commission, what Jesus asks from us is not about college degree or PhD degree. Not about work experience, not about various skills, not about even passionate energy. I'm not saying that they are pointless. Of course, of all these can be a great asset we can have. They are great tools for you to have for his kingdom and his ministry in your reality. But what the Lord Jesus asks from us, first and foremost, is not about that, but our love towards Jesus. That's why Jesus asks you now, do you love me? Yes, we want to do his ministry in our reality, in our family, business, and workplace, and neighbors. Yes, of course, we want to know we are sent by God, Jesus, and we want to share the gospel with them, right? But at that time, we think about, okay, I don't deserve. I cannot do anything because I don't have this one, that one. But what God wants to you is only one. Love towards Jesus. Do you love Jesus? At the time, the love Jesus asks is not some affection or ambition we can manipulate, but love in his divine standard. So today, our question is like this. When the Lord asks us, do you love me? What love does he call from us? What are we how are we to love Jesus, our Lord? That is the message we have to listen to and pray in the name of Jesus today. I'm going to deliver just two facets today. Two facets today. Number one, it is love Jesus more. Yes, my brothers and sisters, love Jesus more than anything. More than anyone. There's a love Jesus wants us to have. Love Jesus more. Love Jesus more than anything, more than anyone else, including the gifts Jesus bestowed upon you. That's the love, actually, that fears the Lord, too. We need that love. Let's go back to the scripture, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, 
just said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Jesus is asking to you like this. With his perfect love, Jesus asks, do you love me more than these? Actually, in Korean translation, because, uh, because the Korean language is like that, we have to choose something. It is written as reference to people, like in uh, more than all these people. But in Greek grammar, uh, Jesus could be referring to other disciples or the fishes that they caught. Even though in Korean translation, it is a people. Actually, the English translation is better than Korean translation. These, these, these. We can understand that there are two kinds of uh, translation. These people or these things. So, many pastors translate like this. Uh, when Jesus said these, these, there are three possible meanings to consider. The first thing is like that. Is your love for me, for Jesus, greater than these people's love for me? Does it make sense? Make sense? Yes. When you truly love someone, we often think that I love that person the most. That's true love, right? When you love somebody, you can think I love him or her the most, more than anyone. Because I love him or I love her. Yes, we love Jesus like that. And second possible meaning is, do you love me more than you love these people? Uh, it's a little bit weaker than other translations according to the context of today's scripture. But this translation is very important for modern Christian. We love many people, right? You love your husband, right? Thank you. <laughs> and you love your wife, right? Yes, yeah. You don't, you don't want to miss this opportunity, right? Do you love your wife? Yes, of course. We love our wife. And you love your children and grandchildren. You love your friend. You love other peoples. You can love many people, right? But at the time, do you love Jesus more than you love other people? That's a very important question for a modern Christian. And the third possible meaning is like this. Do you love me more than these fishes? Yes. We are asked if we love Jesus more than the gift, grace, Jesus has given to us. All three are important questions, but they are still essentially one simple single question like this. Do you love Jesus greater than anyone and more than anything? What should your answer? Yes, yes. Do you love Jesus more? Please give me your answer. Be for God. This is love which Jesus seeks from us. He wants this love, this love. What, is, what does it mean we love Jesus more than anything, anyone? The figure who shows us what it means to love Jesus more is none other than Abraham in the Bible. Abraham received God's vision when he was 75 years old. Hallelujah. And he obeyed God's word throughout his life. He learned greater calling followed it through, and he received the better hope, a better value, and a better choice in his life. Of course, he was not perfect. Never, ever. The Lord promised him that he would become the father of countless people, but he had no child. He had no child even though he followed God for 10 years. So, Following the local customs, he gained Ishmael, Ishmael um, through his wife's servant, Hagal. 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 But as Ishmael 
Ishmael was growing day by day, the Lord spoke to him and said, Abraham will gain his heir through his wife, Sarah. But, as you know, they were too old to give birth any child. Even Sarah, Sarah's condition, his physical condition was not enough to give a birth, a son to Abraham. So, Abraham left. Not out of joy because God said, I'm going to give you a son. But in kind of disdaining sarcasm. He, he, when I make it a little bit, it's like this. Huh? A son? You don't know how old I am? <laughs> oh, Lord, it's okay. It's okay. No, thank you. It's okay. Just bless Ishmael under your wings. Thank you. It was Abraham's response. But you know what? God, God is persistent. God is persistent. Yes, Ishmael will get his blessing because he is still Abraham's line. But the great vision got planted to fulfill through Abraham. What is that? It is actually uh, the, the descendant of Abraham is Jesus Christ. God going to send his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, according uh, through his line, and he's going to give us a salvation, the perfect salvation for all humanity. This is a great vision of God, his plan for Abraham. This vision was to, was to be fulfilled through the son Sarah gives birth. So God, God, when he makes the promise, he will keep it. You know, you have to understand who God is, who our God is. Our God is like this. When he makes his promise, he will keep it through and through whether you believe it or not. We always ask God like that. God, it's okay, it's okay. Just bless Ishmael. What I can do, what I can do. Just bless what I can do, what I can understand. But God is persistent for his plan, his vision for you. We don't believe. We say always, it's okay, it's okay. But God, God going to accomplish his vision with his power, with his strength. That is who God is. He is our Heavenly Father. He will, he will accomplish His promise by His power and by His passion, not your passion. So he received Isaac like that. Abraham received Isaac like that. Their precious son, Isaac. Their precious son, Isaac, grew up old and strong enough to carry many firewood for burnt offering. Can you make sense? You know, for the, for the burnt offering, we need lots of firewood. He could, he could carry many firewood at the time. So that Abraham, it was about 40 to 50 years since the beginning of his spiritual journey. The Lord told Abraham like this, Abraham, bring your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Four facets tells us how much Abraham loves Isaac. Your son, only one son, even though he had Ishmael, Isaac is only one son who accomplished God's vision, right? And Isaac, what does it mean Isaac? Yes, that is son God has given to him, whom you love. Yes, he's a lovely son. Abraham did love Isaac. 
But God continued to say to him like this, Bring him. Bring him. As a burnt offering. Burnt offering. Basically, Abraham was commanded to kill his son. The trip to Mountain Hill in Maria was a three-day trip. Can you imagine the thought flaring in Abraham's head? Yes, of course. But right now, Abraham was not Abraham before. Abraham was a man of faith who had walked, who had walked with God for 40 years at least, or 45 years. He trusted God. When Abraham arrived by the mountain, he told the servants who, who, who were with him to wait at the mountain foot and said, listen carefully, he said to his servant like this, I will go there with my son to worship the Lord, and we come back. He told them, we come back. Not just, I gonna come back. And also, when he climbed the mountain, Isaac felt a little bit weird. So Isaac uh, asked him like this, Father, we have fire and wood, but where is the lamb for the offering? Isaac asked his father Abraham, if we were Abraham, we couldn't continue to climb that mountain, right? But he answered Isaac like this, the Lord will provide himself. And as they arrived to prepare the altar, who do you think prepared the altar? Isaac, not old Abraham. That's why we compare Isaac to our Lord Jesus, right? He, he carried his, his firewood and he, he just, he, he, uh, he, he became a sacrifice for the burnt offering. So our Lord carried his cross and he became the sacrifice for you and me, right? So we can, we can see the shadow of the, our Lord Jesus. Anyway, Abraham tied Isaac and placed him on the altar. He grabbed a knife and prepared himself to kill his son. He was not pretending. In his heart, he truly sacrificed his son. And his action was about to follow. How is this possible? When he talked to his servant, hey, I'm going to go to worship God with my son and we come back. And when he answered his, his son, hey, Isaac, don't worry about that. The Lord will provide himself. It is true. It is true. It is from his heart. And also from his heart, he definitely he is willing to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Actually, it cannot be together, but it is together. How? The book of Hebrews tells about that. Because, because Abraham truly believed in God the Almighty and his domain of life, his death. He knew God could resurrect Isaac even though he going to sacrifice Isaac. And the thought, he was confused about why God commanded such a deed. He trusted God's plan above his logic and understanding. Even though he didn't understand why God asked him like that. <clears throat> he didn't ask Isaac. God was persistent to give the Isaac to Abraham. I didn't ask you, God, why? Why you ask me like this? Yes, maybe in his head, this thought could be happened, but he knew who God it was. He trusted his God. Even though he didn't understand why God asked, God was asking like that, 
he trusts. Even though I sacrificed my son, my God is going to make him alive again. He can do it because he's the almighty God. Yes, of course. So that he held his ground and conviction and as he was about to step Isaac at the moment, actually, the Lord God was very urgent, urgent. He said, Abraham, Abraham. But Abraham was very calm. He answered to the Lord like this, here I am. Can you imagine? When you read a chapter, a Genesis chapter 22, you can imagine that. Abraham, Abraham, because Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only one son, his, love, uh, his loving son, Isaac. So, but even though God can make him alive, but God didn't want that. God doesn't want to kill your son, right? So God called him urgently, Abraham, Abraham. But Abraham, who trusts in God, he was very calm. Because he has been with God for 40 years, 45 years. Sincerely, here I am. At that time, God continued to say to him like this. Look at the Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. Do not harm the boy, the angel said. Do not do anything to him. For now, I know that you fear God because you did not withhold your son, your only son, from me. Let me ask you. Did God test Abraham because God didn't know Abraham's heart? I don't think so. The Lord God knew Abraham, Abraham's heart. But still, he led him through this process so that he could receive the great message and blessing. The Lord revealed and confirmed for Abraham that to fear and love God more than Isaac, the promise, the gift, and the miracles bestowed by God is the heart, life, and conviction Abraham must always hold. Amen? There is a so important point. Okay, let me ask you, my family, what is your Isaac? What is your Isaac? What is your Isaac that God has given to you for his vision, his plan in your life? What precious treasure did the Lord God give you for great vision and commission? Is it your children? Is it your business? Is it your philosophy? Or is it your experience? Is it your ministry entrusted by God? Yes. For me, Isaac, actually, Takman New Life Church is Isaac as given from God to me. I know. I didn't ask that, but God entrusted this church. This is Isaac. It's a very precious one. They are all precious. They are all good things. They are precious, but you must remember. You must love Jesus more than any of those. You must, not you the better, you must. You have to love Jesus more than Isaac God has given to you. That is what God wants to us. Grab and tie your Isaac. Is Isaac dead? Isaac was dead? No. No. He was not dead at the moment. When you confess your love for God with your life, the love that transcends all others, even your beloved Isaac, 
your life becomes the confession of Jehovah Zireh, God the provider. There, you will experience and witness what God had prepared for you and your life. And also, you're going to behold the higher plan of God. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 22, verse 15. Here's what it said. Then, then, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. Yes, we need to listen to this message, the second time message. Second time message. After going through this test, love God more than anything. Anyone. At that time, we can hear his voice a second time. Verse 16. And said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. What does it mean? Because you, you show me, you love me more than Isaac, more than what I've given to you. You love giver, not gift, because I understand that. And you understand what you have to be, what you have to keep hold. So that, verse, verse 17, indeed, indeed, I will greatly bless you. Amen. Yes, when, he, uh, when God called Abraham first time, God blessed Abraham. But this time, it's not just bless him. Greatly bless. I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven as the sand, which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess what? The gate of their enemies. Amen. God wanted to give him this blessing. This blessing. I'm going to greatly bless you again. And your descendant will possess the gate of the enemies. Your descendant will a victor, champion, winner. Who is that? Jesus and his church, you and me. We're going to possess the gate of enemies because we are winner in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, of course. That's why God asked Abraham to offer Isaac so that he could give Abraham this great blessing and great promise. God wants to give us even greater blessing and vision and his promise. He wants us, the spiritual descendant of Abraham, to be victorious over the gates of our enemies. For this great vision, the Lord Jesus brought to us to confirm and confess our love for God. The love that's greater than our affection for Isaac, helping us to be focused on the giver, Jesus, than the gift what God has given to us, Isaac. When Jesus asks us if we love him more than these, these fishes, the 153 kinds of fishes, he's not asking for the childish comparison. He's reminding and confirming the meaning of godly love in the language level that we can understand. Yes, of course. He is the father who reveals the child's love for his dad by asking for the last bit of ice cream. Did you, did you remember that? Yeah. The Lord asks if we love him more than the Isaac he bestowed upon us. And when we confess our love and heart for God, the Lord lifts it, God, the Lord Jesus lifts it up into an even greater blessing and victory of our life journey. Do you love Jesus more than anything? 
Amen. When you love Jesus more than anything and anyone, we immerse ourselves into a deeper and more mature state of love, the love which he wants from us. That's number two. This is the love, Jesus only and holy. My family, my friends, love Jesus only and holy. The second outline is a conclusion of today's message. The love we must achieve is the love that can only be whole and satisfied by Jesus only. Let's go back to the scripture, verse 16. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you, did you find it? Do you love me? Notice how there is no comparative when Jesus asked for the second time. At this point, the love which we must embrace is beyond comparison to someone or something else. It is a state where one loves Jesus only and holy and nothing else. There is nothing else to compare. There is no rival when you love Jesus. But you know what? This love of level, this level of love cannot just happen. It becomes possible after experiencing the sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, usually we simply simply saying that I love Jesus only and holy. I'm satisfied in God. Right? Sometimes we confess before God like that, right? No? Don't worry about next time. Just say. Right? Sometimes we say, oh God, I'm so satisfied by only you. I don't need anything. Yeah, sometimes we confess before God. But that could be just a lip service. Without, without the sacrifice of Isaac. When you have experienced the sacrifice of Isaac, your confession could be true. Your confession will be accomplished. Yes. Only after truly sacrificing Isaac by our heart, the confession of love by action, you can achieve this depth, 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 this depth where you love God with of all your heart and all your will. When you enter this stage, we we'll confess like Paul. Look at the Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. But these assets I have come to regard as liabilities because of Christ. Even though he knew uh, his assets, but he regards it as liabilities because of Christ. More than that, I now regard all things as liabilities compared to the far greater value of knowing Jesus my Lord. Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Indeed, I regard them as what? Dung. I love this translation. That I may gain Christ and be found in him. Paul knew the benefits of every his assets he had. He was circumcised on the eighth day after birth. He was an Israelite of the Benjamin tribe, which means pure blood, the citizen of Israel. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee before the Lord, and he was, he was a student of Gamaliel, which means he had a great degree. They were all precious gifts given by the grace of God, right? Of course. But Paul confessed not only did he love Jesus more than everything he had, as his knowledge and intimacy in Jesus grew deeper, everything he once held dear and precious was nothing. Not just rubbish. Dung. Dung. Do you know what means dung? Yes. They had no 
competition against his love for Jesus. In fact, he began to consider them liabilities and rubbish, waste, done. Only that remained in him was his desire to know Christ Jesus more. At that time, knowing is not just about information, true knowledge, because we have fellowship intimately and deeply. And to be found in Christ. This is what it means to love Jesus only and wholly. Yes, of course. God wants such love for us as he asks, do you love me? The Lord who loves us first gave us such profound and divine love through words and action, through the cross and resurrection. And now, Jesus asks you for the same love. I know, we never had such divine love. It was alien, impossible for you and me. But God still loved, uh, loves us in this way. As those who receive such grace and his love, I urge you to love Jesus. Love Jesus more than anything, anyone. More than Isaac, God has given to you. You will find you love Jesus only and wholly. Let's pray.